south were moving into this area of posterior lateral skull base. We see the jugular foramina lateral to the anterior half of the occipital condyles. Uh, the condyles are anterior lateral to the foramen magnum from one to three and nine to 11 o'clock. And you see the jugular fossa on the lower surface of the temporal bone, the sigmoid, the foramen is directed forward under the temporal bone and it's larger on the right side usually. So we move from this area down to the jugular foramen, down to the area along the occipital and lateral condyle. Uh, and in this area, just below and medial to the jugular foramen, we have the jugular tubercle that blocks, if you're lifting cerebellum, blocks access to the front of the brain stem. And here's 12th nerve, and it comes through. This is occipital condyle. It comes through the bone just above the mid portion, if you look at occipital condyle, from back to front, it passes above the mid portion of the occipital condyle. Uh, if you drill off to the side of the condyle, then in this area, if you drill paracondylar, you expose the back of the jugular foramen uh, in this paracondylar location so that we're working in this corner of the skull base and uh, let's see help us with these muscles uh, on the back of the neck uh, what is this trapezius sternocleidomastoid and this is splenius uh, and we call this area between the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius that's the what triangle at the neck? Posterior triangle. Now we fold with the trapezius downward, the sternocleidomastoids forward, and we're looking at splenius, and this is semispinalis capitis, and we reflect the, the splenius under it we see what muscle. This is longissimus capitis, and the occipital artery, if you're doing bypasses, can either pass deep or superficial to the longissimus capitis. And then you reflect the semispinalis capitis, and you see the suboccipital triangle. When I first started doing far lateral approaches, or transcondylar, I turned these muscles as individual layers, and I found that it was very uh, difficult to close, and uh, with a high rate of pseudomeningocele and wound dehiscence. So we turn all of these muscles down with the scalp flap, as a single layer. It's just so much easier to close. These muscles form the border of the suboccipital triangle. So this is superior oblique. It runs from occipital bone to transverse process of C1. Any one, this is inferior oblique. It runs from transverse process of C1, the spine of C2, and then from spine of C2 to occipital bone. Rectus capitis posterior major.
What muscle is it that runs from occipital bone to C1? And rectus, capitis, posterior, minor. The suboccipital triangle is between these three muscles. <coughs> And the importance of that is the vertebral artery as it passes behind the atlantal condyle is in the depths of this triangle, often embedded in this venous plexus that Sam Malmethy calls the second cavernous sinus. So here we reflected the superior oblique, the inferior oblique, the rectus capitis, and when we reflect those muscles, we see the vertebral artery ascending through the transverse process of C1, usually passing behind the atlantal condyle. But if the arteries are tortuous, this vertebral artery can pass higher behind the occipital condyle or even rest against the occipital bone where it would be very easy to damage it in a retrosigmoid craniotomy. And the artery just before it enters the dura here usually gives off a big posterior meningeal branch that you usually sacrifice but you don't want to confuse this with an extradural origin of the pica that occurs in about 10% of cases. Here we see the atlantal condyle, here below the occipital condyle, and we can open this dura down. For vascular pathology, you can often do a removal of the ipsilateral half of the posterior arch of C1, uh, but for tumor pathology, we often need a wider opening here of the foramen magnum and C2, and in that case, we would use then the horseshoe type of flap and flap that downward. Uh, if you're just dealing with pathology right here, at the dural entrance of an aneurysm arising from the pica, then you don't need a wide laminectomy and you could do a hockey stick incision to complete the far lateral approach. And here we drill supracondylar. We preserve the joint. This is, we drilled off some of the occipital condyle. And here you see the hypoglossal nerve passing above the condyle uh, in a supracondylar approach. If you drill out this condyle, you have access to the lower clivus. And I've used this approach in drilling out chordomas, especially when they've extended into the condyle here. You can get at these in a supracondylar approach. Uh, here we've opened a cup of dura around the vertebral artery so it can be mobilized. We see the hypoglossal nerve in the hypoglossal canal and 9, 10, 11 then entering the jugular foramen above. Over in this area we have jugular foramen uh, here in front of this paracondylar part of the occipital bone. And now, here we mobilize the vertebral, and this is a, what is that? That's an extradural origin of the pica, so you want to be very careful and not include that artery extradurally. Here we've also drilled out paracondylar to expose the back side of the jugular foramen, a posterior approach to the foramen. But this just compares far lateral approach with a transcondylar approach. And you see, even though the condyles are anterolateral, they still can block access to the front of the brain stem. 
and here's the approach drilling out the occipital condyle you see how much further forward that angle is and if you pull this dura backwards you can drill out the condyles and in a transcondylar approach you can actually look across in front of the medulla to the contralateral vertebral artery we're looking under the hypoglossal nerve you can get into the lower clivus and take out cordoma in the lower clivus all the way across to the contralateral hypoglossal canal so this is a route you can take the lower half of clivus without coming through the oral cavity or through the nasal cavity now here we detach the rectus capitis lateralis and have done a paracondylar exposure and here if the pathology locks off the jugular bulb then you can ligate the sigmoid and the internal jugular vein and you can resect this segment of the sigmoid from the back after you mobilize the vertebral artery but this posterior approach will not get you forward to much of the pathology in the jugular foramen that extends forward down the eustachian tube or into the infratemporal fossa and here's just the exposure of the nerve from the back but we see nine ten and this is the 11 here and this is the hypoglossal nerve coming through the hypoglossal canal but you see four nerves join the internal jugular vein and carotid just below the jugular foramen in the upper part of the carotid sheath and arising right here is what nerve what arises from nine here anyone jacobson's nerve what does J jacobson's nerve eventually become jacobson's nerve crosses the promontory and it becomes the what lesser petrosal which ends up going through what ganglion Odic, and ends up innervating parotid gland now what nerve is this that passes along the anterior wall of the jugular ball the jugular fossa arnold's nerve what does arnold's nerve where does it end up it ends up in the skin around the external canal so you can get an exposure like this from the back and here is just you can look in paracondylar we usually save some of that venous wall over these nerves and if you can do that then you preserve uh, uh, usually preserve these nerves so, uh, but here's the roof of the jugular foramen and in the cistern nine is often a tear at the ten you can't tell nine from ten but always at the roof of the jugular foramen there's a dural septum between nine and ten and we call this the glossal pharyngeal meatus a little cave that nine enters and this is the vagal meatus that ten and 11 pass through at the dural roof of the foramen so here we see jugular foramen the inferior petrosal sinus passes through the petrosal part sigmoid passes through the larger sigmoid part and we blow this up petrosal part sigmoid part intrajugular part with nine 10, 11, and these are, what is that nerve? That's 12. 
and it enters a bifid hypoglossal canal. When you see that, usually the two bundles of rootlets join before they reach the extracranial end of the hypoglossal canal. And then you can remove the jugular ball from the jugular fossa, and we see nine, origin of Jacobson's hair, ten, Arnold's nerve, uh, cranial and spinal eleven, and here's twelve passing through the hypoglossal canal in a supracondylar location, and they all join in the carotid sheath just below the foramen. So that if we look from below now, internal jugular vein, uh, some of the relationships on the front, you have the carotid artery, and pathology out of the bulk could follow the carotid. Here's the eustachian tube, and pathology in the jugular bulk can follow the eustachian tube forward. Laterally here we have the, what is that? Facial nerve, styloid. Here we see 12 coming above the condyle and joining the nerves in the carotid sheath. And what muscle is this? Rectus, capitis, lateralis that attaches to the skull base. Here's the condyle. It attaches just lateral to the condyle behind the jugular foramen. And here we detach that muscle. We drill out the occipital bone. Condyle part of it is still here, hypoglossal nerve. We drilled it out in a paracondylar approach to expose the back of the jugular foramen. But we said most pathology in the jugular fossa extends forward down the eustachian tube, along the carotid, follows the corda tympani, gets into the infratemporal fossa, and you have the facial nerve directly lateral. So for this, we use a postauricular incision that you can fold this flap forward and follow the pathology anteriorly. And here's facial nerve lateral to jugular ball and the carotid sheath uh, so that often this pathology will extend forward. You can follow it forward, carotid going to middle fossa. What nerve is that? that runs on the upper surface of a petrous parotid. GSPN, and we're at infratemporal fossa, and from there it runs forward in the, what is that? Median nerve, uh, headed toward the tergopalatine fossa that we talked about yesterday. So, and just another view of this, but carotid, inside the carotid shape, uh, facial nerve descending laterally. Uh, for these approaches, we move the facial nerve forward, and we want to preserve the stylomastoid artery that supplies the facial nerve. So we do a postauricular incision, we expose the mastoid and do a neck dissection, uh, combine the two. We often have to resect at least the posterior half of the external auditory canal. And here we turned up a little flap of fascia to use in closing the canal. And then we drill out the mastoidectomy that you've already done. Uh, and we have facial nerve descending lateral to the jugular ball here. It descends lateral to the jugular ball that's 
in an infralabyrinthine position. There's facial nerve, and this is part of tympany. What canal? Lateral posterior. So you've already done part of this approach, but often to get into the jugular bulb, you have to move this facial nerve forward. It's an anterior transposition. If you save a cup of tissue at the stylomastoid foramen and preserve this stylomastoid artery, usually you do this and there's no facial weakness. Uh, here now we freed up the facial nerve, lateral posterior canal. What bone is this? Incus. And this is stapes here, below the facial nerve, lateral canal above. What is this? Eustachian tube that opens forward. And you usually, we resected the posterior half of the external canal, but you get forward on the ball, and especially if the carotid's involved, you often have to resect the external canal, remove the tympanic membrane, jugular fossa pathology can get into the middle air, run down the eustachian tube, so that this is the exposure. The bulb has been exposed now. The facial nerve descends directly lateral. We save a cup of tissue around the nerve and save the stylomastoid artery. You usually have to resect some of the ossicles, but when you move the facial nerve forward, if you leave the stapes in the oval window, you can preserve some hairy. Here we see the petrosal part of the foramen. Here the sigmoid part of the foramen. And then in this notch, the interjugular part, is where the nerves are going to pass through between the petrosal and sigmoid part of the foramen. And the pathology in this area usually occludes the jugular ball so that you can ligate the sigmoid and the internal jugular vein, and you can look in behind the sigmoid, open retrosigmoid. Here we see A910. You can ligate the sigmoid, and the jugular vein are usually occluded, and you can open it. And if you, once you ligated and resected this lateral half of the vein, if you save the medial venous wall, then you can protect 9, 10, 11, and this is, what nerve is that? Coming through between 10 and 11, it's going backwards. That's 12 that's going to run forward to the tongue. But if you preserve this medial venous wall, you can usually preserve all of those nerves. Here's the petrosal part of the foramen. Uh, but if you have to resect that medial venous wall, then you're working directly on the surface of the nerves, and it's uh, very hard to preserve these nerves, and you can work at it, but uh, once that medial venous wall comes up by the risk of the nerves greatly increases, there's nine, the other nerves, after the venous wall is elevated, here's the stapes He's still in the oval window, so here he is preserved. So this is a tour uh, through Posterior lateral skull base, um, uh, far lateral. Uh, I thank you all so much for allowing me to join you, and uh, I love being a part of this great surgical team that uh, 
uh, Professor Robertson has assembled here. Uh, thank you so much.